As promised, our sermon text is Genesis chapter 15. You'll find that in your pew Bibles on page 10. It's verses 1 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, but your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years but I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed through these pieces. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. About 30 years ago, I heard a sermon on this text. It's the only time before this week that I had heard a sermon on this text. I've never preached it either. And it was one of those sermons that I remember. It was preached by Matt Gray, who was uh, the son of Richard Gray, and uh, he was a son of this church. And uh, I don't know if you ever remember sermons that were preached 30 years ago, but they, they stick with you. Uh, I'm also thankful to people like John Piper and Tim Keller who have uh, chimed in on this passage of Scripture, and one of the old masters, Matthew Henry, also had some interesting things to say, and uh, some of their ideas will be reflected in the text. If you were to uh, list, if you know your Bible well, and you were to list the top ten characters in the Bible, Um, I would think that Abraham would be on that list somewhere. And even if you don't know the Bible real well, you would probably list Abraham as one of the great Bible characters. And every major religion claims Abraham, don't they? They The Christians, the uh, Muslims, and the Jews. He is, in fact, the father of of the nations. In Genesis chapter 12, we are introduced to him. Uh, His name is Abraham, but when we first meet him, his name is Abram, which means exalted father. It's not until Genesis chapter 17 that God changes his name to Abraham, uh, father of a multitude. He's first mentioned in Genesis 11 as uh, in the line of Shem, one of Noah's sons. When the Lord divides the nations, his ancestors do not travel very far. He's living in the Ur of the Chaldees, not too far from the site of the Tower of 
Babel. And it is here that God speaks to him. There are three places where God speaks to Abraham, chapter 12, chapter 15, and chapter 17 of Genesis. In chapter 12, God speaks to this man who has no previous contact with the Creator. Interesting, he is a pagan. He has money, he has servants, he has a wife, he has an extended family. We know of his father and his nephew Lot and Lot's wife and children. A lot of people, but he has no children of his own. And God comes into his settled life and disrupts his life. And isn't that something that God has a way of doing? We may not like to have our lives disrupted, but God does. Abraham is 75 years old in chapter 12. That's middle-aged for uh, those days, sort of at the end of your biological clock. And when the boy Isaac is born, he is 100 and Sarah is 90. So now the biological clock is really approaching the midnight hour. I just heard today that a movie actor, Laura Linney, just had a baby uh, one month shy of her 50th birthday. So when she goes to her son's high school graduation, everyone will think that she's the grandma. He had to wait, Abraham had to wait 25 years for an impossible promise to be fulfilled. God's relationship with Abram covers a period of 100 years from chapter 12 through 25 and can be described as one of waiting on God. Now, I don't know how many of you men think that your life consists of waiting on your wife. I think it's like three hours of your married life you spend at the door uh, waiting for your wife to get ready to go out. Forgive me if you think that that's a sexist remark or forget I said it, but think about Abraham waiting constantly waiting, waiting a long time for God to fulfill his promises. God always takes the long view. We are time bound. Tim Keller puts it like this. He, he heard it from somebody else and, he, and I heard it from Keller. God says to Abraham, I want you to go. And Abraham says, go where? And God says, I'll tell you later. God says to Abraham, I will make you a blessing. And Abraham says, why? And God says, I'll tell you later. God says to Abraham, I will give you land. Abraham says, where? And God says, I'll tell you later. And God says, I'll give you a child. And Abraham says, how? And God says, I'll tell you later. And God says to Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your child. And Abraham says, why? And God says, I'll tell you later. He had to wonder, who exactly is this God? And what does he want with me? And can he be trusted? Well, he's about to find out. God tells Abraham to leave his home. He will make his name great. And if you refer back to last week to the Tower of Babel, remember what they did? They built a tower in order to make their name great, and God brought the tower down. Now he says to Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. A great name is always connected to the God of covenant-keeping faithfulness. I will make your name great. I will make you into a great nation. And through you, I will bless the entire world. Now in chapter 15, the passage that we read, God speaks to Abram again, and he repeats the promise made, and he expands on it. This nation that will come from you uh, is, is not through an adopted heir or through a servant. The promise will come through your very own son. The promise is sealed by a covenant. Now what is a covenant? Well, it's a solemn oath sealed in blood. That's a definition by Palmer Robertson in his book on the covenant. A solemn oath sealed in blood. We make covenants today, we don't seal them in blood. When you married, you made a covenant. When you bought your house, you made a covenant with the bank. They would give you the money and you would pay them back. You signed in ink. You did not sign in blood. Not really, except people talk about blood, sweat, and tears. There are only two parties 
that make the pledge in every contract, either two groups of people or two individuals. But something unusual happens here. And I'll tell you in just a minute. Here's the theme. God promises to carry out his plan of redemption for Abram and for us. He will be faithful to us and for us. He will be faithful to us, but he will also be faithful for us. He's going to take the responsibility to carry out the promise of both parties. The passage begins after these things. The word of the Lord came to Abram. What are those things? Well, you have to go back and read chapter 13 and 14. Uh, I didn't cover them in this series, but we know that Abraham is a busy guy. He gets himself into trouble in Egypt, and he gets Lot out of trouble, at least temporarily. And when Abraham helps to defeat an enemy who has run off with Lot and his possessions, the king of Sodom, out of gratefulness, wants to give Abram a reward. And Abraham refuses. He said, we'll just take what belongs to us. We will take no more. He doesn't want a reward. As Matthew Henry puts it, Abram has just had a conversation with an earthly king about an earthly reward, and now he talks with a heavenly king about a heavenly reward. And before we look at the passage as a whole, I want you to see verse 6. It's a key verse in Genesis. Abram believed God, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is not only a great verse in Genesis, it's a great verse in all of the Bible. Get a yellow liner out. Draw fireworks, sparks, in the margins. This verse explodes with power in Scripture and, and all through the pages of the New Testament. This verse fuels the writings of Paul in Galatians and in Romans. It's not by works, but by faith that we are right with God. This, this passage is cited in the book of Hebrews in chapter 6 that God's a God who, who keeps his covenant promises. He does not need to swear by anything greater than himself. His word is enough. And then he says that this promise of God to be a blessing and to bless us is, is, the, is the anchor that keeps the soul. It's connected. It doesn't, it doesn't wave in the ocean. It, it goes down into the ground and holds tight while the ocean currents are, are moving. It's something that holds you steadfast, the covenant promises of God. This verse sings of God's mercy down through church history. Justification, being right with God by faith, Fired up Martin Luther. You kids have off tomorrow for Martin Luther King's Day. I don't want you to confuse this Martin Luther in church history with Martin Luther King. But justification by faith fueled the Reformation and the teachings of Martin Luther. This is, this is gospel. This is bedrock Christianity. We cannot go deeper than this to build our foundation. We get right with God through total reliance, trust, and commitment upon God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is faith. Here is a man, Abram, a pagan when God calls him. And God tells him that he is part of a great plan through no credit of his own and leads him to saving faith. This is gospel. I have nothing to bring. I have no goodness of my own. I exchange my filthy rags for his robe of righteousness. It is not earned. It is not deserved. Our resume says garbage. Paul knew that. He was a faithful Jew, well-educated, well-schooled in the teachings of Judaism, a man who had every honor that man could give him. And he said, before man, uh, I have a great resume, but before God, my resume is complete garbage. I have nothing that will impress God. I can only cling to God's character, to God's promises, to God's provision. This is what Genesis 15 is all about. Notice that... This does not say that Abraham believed in God. I think that everybody here 
You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in God. Everybody here believes in God. 85 to 90 percent of Americans say they believe in God. That simply means that he exists. Uh, but believing in God is not the same as believing God, you see. The Bible says that the demons believe and they tremble. <laughs> That does nothing for you as far as eternity is concerned. Abram believed God. And that means that every day with the ups and downs and changing landscape of the circumstances in your life, I will believe God. I will hold on over the long haul. I will believe God. I will be patient. I will let God write his story. I am impatient. I want it done now. God takes the long view. He will take whatever time he needs. He's going to do what he's going to do. And I know whatever it is and however long it takes, it is for my good. That's faith. He believed God. And there's three things that Abraham believed when it says that he believed God. First of all, he believed God's character. He believed God's character. Don't be afraid, he says, I am your shield and your very great reward. Now I understand don't be afraid. If God ever appeared to you somehow and you knew he was, it was him, uh, you would be afraid too. Uh, and you would be waiting to see if what he has to say is good news or, or bad news. When God speaks to him directly, he is afraid. And then God says to him, I'm your shield and I am your very great reward. I'm your shield against anything and anyone that would seek to derail you from accomplishing the purposes I have for you. Remember the psalmist says, you, O oh Lord, are our shield about me. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. The enemies are all around. Ephesians 6, we have a shield to protect us in our faith. That's the part of the character of God. I'm your shield, but I'm also your very great reward. That's what the NIV says. The ESV, the, the, the translation I am using, says your reward shall be great. Now there's a difference there. Which is it? Is God saying I am your reward or is God saying I will give you a reward? Well, it's both, isn't it? I've begun to learn in my life what it means for God to be my reward. Who do I have in heaven but you? There, there's nothing on earth that I desire but you. You are my strength and my portion forever. That means that when my health fails, when my youth fails, when my strength fails, and it's already failing, and my friends fail, God never fails. And in this text, I think it's the second meaning, uh, although to Abraham, God was both, uh, that he is the rewarder of, of Abraham. Matthew Henry says, Abraham refuses that earthly gift from an earthly king in order to receive an eternal gift from heaven's king. God says, uh, there is a reward that I will give you. And Abraham says, what can you possibly give me that could take away the longing for a child. What um, good are my riches if I don't have an heir? I'm an old man and my wife is an old lady. Will your promises be fulfilled? And Eliezer, he's a member of my household and my servant. And God says, no, it's not in him. You will have your very own son. And there's a third characteristic of God that comes out of Abraham's own mouth. It comes through his prayer. He says, O oh Lord God. And the NIV captures the meaning by translating the sovereign God. In other words, Abraham knew nothing. Abraham, this pagan, is beginning to know who God is, the God who calls him in chapter 12, the God who's moving him along through chapters 13 and 14. He suddenly says, sovereign God. He knows that there's somebody else now that's in charge of his life. He's learning what we all need to learn, that God's in charge. For Abraham, it will be 25 more years before the promise is fulfilled. It's a long time to wait. Is he still sovereign? I don't know what you're waiting for, but is he still sovereign? And you will find in Abraham a desire to want to speed things up, to help God out, to, to bring God's promises along. We understand that. The question is, do you believe God? 
Do you believe that God is supreme, that he is in charge, and that he will give whatever he promises in his time? The challenge, of course, is that you remember this. You remember this when you're in one of those hard places. God is my shield. God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is sovereign, and nothing will throw him off, change his mind, or block his path. This is faith. This is what it means to believe God, to believe God's character. You can trust him because of who he says he is. But you can also believe God's promises. And God gives Abram a visual illustration. He says, Abram, I know what I've said is hard to handle, but Let's go outside. Now, in the beginning, he has a vision, and he's probably in a house. And I don't know whether he wakes up here or whether this is still a part of the vision, but he takes him outside, and he says, look up at the stars. Try to count them. You can't do it. Now, about four nights ago, I think it was the last clear night we had, uh, and I was studying this passage, I decided to go out and look up and count the stars. And you know what? I actually could. Uh, you go, what? Be because of the sky shine. There, you know, there's only about 15 or 20 stars. They're beautiful, but, but I could count them all. And I said, but if, but if I were out in the mountains or out west, someplace where there, we're not near a city, and, and we, we kind of lose the, the image of this, don't we, because of the sky shine, you would see, um, and the last time I think I saw that kind of a sky was in a planetarium where they fake it. But, but you see a sky completely covered with dots. You can't possibly count them. So shall your offspring be, Abram. Through the birth of one boy I will build a nation and I will bless you beyond your wildest imagination. I invite you to go out and to look up and on the clearest nights here, we can't see what Abraham saw, but you can get the idea. When you see a sky full of stars, you see the love of God for this world. You see the faithfulness of God to you. You see that you are a fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. The Bible says that all who come to Jesus by faith are sons of Abraham. And that means that you are not lost in a mass of humanity on a tiny planet in a huge universe. You are not neglected. God cares for you. You are part of the fulfillment of God's promise to our spiritual father, Abram. We say with the psalmist, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? Who am I? That you would be mindful of him, that you would think about me. Now there's a great pattern that emerges in this text in verses 1 through 5 that's repeated in verses 7 through 11. I don't want you to miss this. And verse 6 is the hinge. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's the hinge. But in verses 1 through 5, God says, this is my character, this is who I am. The second part is that Abraham asks a question. What will you give me? And then God uses this powerful image to, as a symbol of his faithfulness. Look to the heavens. Well, this pattern is now repeated in verses 7 through 11. God declares who he is in verse 7. I'm the Lord who brought you out. Doesn't that remind you of the Lord speaking in the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now he's saying to Abram, I'm the God who brought you out of the land of the Ur of the Chaldees. This is who I am. And this is followed by a second question on the part of Abraham. How can I know that I am to possess this land? And Abram is not rebuked because this is hard to get your hands around. These are big truths, aren't they? Huge. Abram is so small. How does he possibly get his mind around this? God's purpose is so great. And God's not short with Abram. He doesn't say, because I said so. You know, he says, Abram, I'll give you another image that you can look at. We can work through this so you can understand. 
What follows is something that we are not familiar with in Genesis 15. Abraham knew what it was. This was the way in those days that people would sign a contract. This means that I am committed. There are consequences if I break the contract. In those days, two parties would act out the consequences. They would take animals, and they're listed here, and they would cut them in half. It sounds pretty gruesome in our day, but, but, but back then when every mom you know, would butcher her own chicken for dinner, it's not too hard to, to comprehend. They would cut animals in half, and they would lay out the pieces, not the birds. They were, they were too little. And there will be blood. There will be blood. The parties to the covenant would walk between the pieces. And they would, in essence, be saying, if, if I don't do what I said I will do, I will be cut in half. I will be food for the birds. You see that? That the birds come, and, and they have to drive them off. Why? Because it's food. Their carcasses, food for the birds. In verse 12, the sun goes down. And Abram goes to sleep. Again, I don't know whether this is part of the original vision or whether he came out of the vision and then went to sleep, but he goes from a vision to a dream. And deep darkness falls on him. This is more than the darkness of night. This is the darkness of, of, of chaos and of, of, uh, of fear. It's a bad dream because of what God reveals to Abram. God says, Abram, there's going to be a little problem with the blessing. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. Your descendants are going to have a hard time. They're going to be taken and afflicted for 400 years. He's talking about their slavery in Egypt. And Abraham might have been thinking, what, what happened to the blessing? Did God forget? No. And then he says they're going to be delivered and they're going to come back to this land, this land where you are only a sojourner but which they will possess. You will not be there then because you will have already gone on to your reward. You will pass away into my presence. But they will come back and, conquer and take this land. And now here is what happens next. As he's dreaming, as he's watching what happens, a smoking pot and a flaming torch pass through the animal parts. What in the world is that? Well, they represent, I think, the presence of God like the cloudy pillar and the pillar of fire that led Israel through the wilderness. You remember that was God's presence. And this is kind of like the pillar and the fire in, in miniature, going through the parts, going down the line of the animal parts that are separated. What's strange here, and listen, what's strange here is that Abram doesn't walk through with God. Don't the, both parts of the parties to the covenant have to walk through? Not here. He contributes nothing. You see, God passes through, not Abraham. This is the gospel, is it not? God says, I made the covenant. I have made the promise. You contribute nothing to this. You want assurance that everything I have said will happen? If I don't do what I have said, I will die. I will be cut in half. I will cease to exist. I will not be God. I will be ripped in pieces. And you say, impossible. That can't happen to God. Exactly. God takes the responsibility to do what he has promised. And Abram does not walk. He's resting while God does the work. God takes on the responsibility to do his part. And God takes on the responsibility to do Abram's part and my part, and your part, in this wonderful covenant of grace. Do you understand what this is saying? This is not a 50-50 proposition. It's not a cooperative agreement. God takes the curse for him and for you. God says, I will, I will bless you even if I have to die. I will shed my blood in order that this promise is fulfilled. And this is what happens at the cross on that day when Jesus was crucified. Darkness! Darkness covers the earth. If something happened to the promise, no, God works in strange and mysterious ways. Jesus dies. 
And Isaiah 53 says, he was cut off from the land of the living. The covenant God cut was cut with his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our substitute. He dies in our place. Abraham does not walk with the smoke and fire because Jesus walks through it for him. Someone is unfaithful. Someone has to die. It is not God that is unfaithful. It is Abram. It is you. It is me. And when we were unfaithful, the immortal dies. The darkness of the curse falls upon him. I don't know how much of this Abraham understood, of course, but faith brought him to the place of profound trust in the power and the pledge of God to keep his promise for him. Some of you may be wondering, God, will you keep your promises? And you know that he will. But I have a second question, and you may be asking it too. I trust God. It's me that I don't trust. What do I do about me and my sins? God will fulfill his part, but I never will forget will complete my part because if it were up to me I would fail I'm a weak sinner I can't keep my part of the deal and God takes it for us you see that his son Jesus dies on our behalf his holy demands are met his love is confirmed run to the cross Jesus paid it all you have only to rest in his finished work this is the anchor for the soul that keeps you safe and secure while the sea waves roll. John Piper puts it this way, and with this I will conclude. Who then are the heirs of the precious and very great promises made to Abram and his seed? You are. To you, God says, your sins are forgiven. I am for you. With all my power, goodness, and mercy, I will pursue you all your life, and you will rise from the dead. Your name will be great, your assembly as the stars of the heavens. You will possess the gates of your enemies. All the earth will be your inheritance, and you will fill the new world with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. To whom can all that be said? To you, the children of Abraham through faith, in Christ for all things are yours all the promises are yours for you are Christ and Christ is God's and all I can say to that is amen may we pray together Thank you, Lord, for this passage that describes so clearly for us the gospel. We see Jesus willing to give up the glory of heaven to take on our infirmities and our sins and be cut off for us to complete our part of the covenant. That's outstanding. And we give you all praise. And would it change us at the deepest places of our heart and long to tell this story to others.